and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's <laughs> greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I've a returning good brother to the temple. He is a graduate and valedictorian of the Crit Academy, and is and is the man currently put currently pushing forward for extraordinary expeditions. The man who will handle it, Justin Handlin. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> I am awesome. What a great opening, man! <laughs> you really you've really got it uh, down pat. I love it. Well, <laughs> you know how you get into Carnegie Hall, right? What's that? Practice. Yeah, <laughs> you've nailed it. Then, oh. uh, man, I could learn. I could learn something from you. <laughs> so, I will. I'll skip over the humble beginnings thing since we did. Since we covered that last time, so okay. you're you're working on extraordinary expeditions, which you're describing as a set of modular adventures for fit for fifth edition. Um, yes. Now, I suppose I suppose we can hit the ground running on that. Um. Modular is a modular is a word that has a ver that casts a very wide net. If you'll forgive me for making fishing jokes, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, not no, uh, sorry, toss not the sorry, line out, it's fine. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. I'm Minnesotan, <laughs> <laughs> and the the fishing opener is a state holiday. <laughs> but what? But what exactly does what exactly does modular entail in? In the in the case of these adventures, and how do you how do you how do you plan on making adventures uh, modular? All right. Well, so um, you know, when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons, there is a specific format that they they um, they use, um, and generally, it's it's so detailed, it's down to. Every little room. Here's what's in this room. Here's what's over here. It's. It reminds me very much of the old school, like hardcore dungeon crawl type stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But um, with that comes a lot of fluff text into fleshing out those very specific rooms. When in the vast majority of games, most players don't visit every single room. So, in my opinion, that's a lot of written space mm -hmm. that's filled up with something that the DM generally can just make up on the fly. So mm -hmm. we took we took an idea from an old uh, an old style. Uh, it's fun. It's fun. I'm about to say this. An old style adventure type called uh, that was similar to uh, called uh, Dungeon Delves, mm -hmm. where it's basically the the short adventures. But instead of focusing on the detailed room to room kind of aspects that some of the adventures focus on now, we wanted to be able to pull it out and spend more writing space i guess you could say on the details that flesh out the encounters and the areas around it not necessarily the minutia of individual rooms mm -hmm. what this means is when you develop an encounter say like our our we, the one we give away free is called uh, far touched mm -hmm. we may not have full details of every little uh, room in every single one of those houses but a lot of text goes into what is at that location what are the people that are important and the overall um, inclusion of what's going to make the encounter fun instead of just filling it with what we at the time were kind of considering nonsense that you don't need. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that obviously every DM and every person's got their own detail on what you would consider, you know, unnecessary or whatever. But we really wanted to take a frame where it doesn't matter what type of D, D game you're running where it's at the the adventures we built can easily be um fit just the way they are right into your stories and campaigns that also means it, they they're written in such a way that they all require very little or no prep too which also makes it very um uh free-flowing for the dungeon master while we offer you know guidance through the adventures of what will make you know, an overall story, the DM isn't limited to, okay, here's the, in this, in this, you know, house, these are the six rooms. Here's what's in these six rooms. No, instead there are 20 houses. Here's some of the things you'll find in. Here's the one that's important. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
it also uh, specializes in world building. Um, so when we first started our, 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 our adventures, the very first thing we do is give several, uh, a couple paragraphs on where the setting is taking place. And it's detailed enough to allow you to create a fully new area in your world, or it's also vague enough in a way that if you've got another place you would rather, you can simply change a few words and it'll fit right into your themes. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we say modular framework, we leave it very open to um, be changed in rant. So for instance, in Far Touched, that is a, a, a free adventure that we give away to anybody that wants to check it out, which take place in a small village of Redhold, which is basically mm -hmm. under siege by monsters. It gives you an important NPC named Lorelei Swift Whistle. Um, and you know, she's the leader of this heaven's light guild right there. We've given you some world building, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a city of red hold. There's an important NPC named swift thistle. Um, and she's the lever leader of whatever these heaven's light guild are, but you can easily replace all three of those and still run the adventure as written mm -hmm. and not have any issues with, um, um, dealing with some of those changes. Um, and I guess it's, it's, um, because of we've given you the red hold, um, for instance, there is a full description on the city and the location. So it's already set up for you should you decide to use it as is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really kind of the core that we wanted when we went into every section of our breakdown because each one's broken down into four parts. Mm -hmm. So we decided, okay, what can we do to make this more versatile so it doesn't matter what setting you're running? It? Honestly, several of the people that played this uh, actually ran it for Pathfinder. All they changed was the monsters. They were able to run everything else as is. And that says a lot to how versatile it is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, or m modular. Yeah. Um, now, for, for the next question... This is this is one of those this is one of those questions where there's a bit of um there's a bit of setup that I have to br have to bring up beforehand, mm -hmm. um, yep. especially especially given the question of modularity. There is a um there was a ter there's a term that I've used a few times that I shamelessly stole from the uh, from the production of Gargoyles. I called, love Gargoyles. What a great show! Called Tears and Tent Poles, which was created as a kind of compromise because. Networks hated and pro probably still do serialization. They yes. they want they want to be able to put any episode in a, in a time slot no ma no matter what no matter what and serialized stories you can't re you can't really do that until at least not until you end up hitting a hundred episodes. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Obviously, I doubt that's the case nowadays. But it what but it was like that for the longest time. Mm -hmm. But. The comprom the compromise that Gargoyles had put forward is, um, he we have we have two particular um cate categories of episode types. These episodes you can put in any order, but only between these particular milestones. So you have one milestone, then you have some episodes that you can put in whatever order you want over the coming weeks. Then another milestone, and then the process repeats itself. Huh. That's the intriguing. Um. Given the given the fact that you have a that you have a a act structure, at, at least with uh, at least with far yep. at least with far touched, I'm, and I'm yep. pretty sure with the other ones. Yes, sir. Um, within 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 the within the tri within that act structure, do you have? Would you say that you have something similar where there are events that you can pick and choose from in between um, major parts of the adventure? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's, that's one of the things that makes it so expansive for homebrew. Because let's be honest, I, I, I don't know about you, but in my experience, while most people love um, some of the content that comes out through books and stuff, they tend to want to do their own thing. Um, even me as a person who owns almost every single one of the official WotC books, I never, ever run it as is. And I feel at least based on the people I interviewed, that's pretty consistent um, because everyone has their own way of doing things or their table likes to focus on something specific. Mm -hmm. And so by breaking up by acts, here's the things that are going to happen. You can do whatever you want in, be, in these acts, but then once you're ready to move on, you go on to the next step. And that gives a lot of versatility to the dungeon master to say, okay, my team really likes combat. 
So mm -hmm. when we're doing the Act Two in the Muddy March, where they're trying to d get to the town, I'm going to add a plethora more of combat encounters mm -hmm. because that's what my team likes. Meanwhile, another team m might love um, role play and they might like interacting with the NPCs. So instead, they might spend way more time in Act One interacting with the other adventuring parties that are taking place. While mm -hmm. we give an example of one adventuring group. The DM can totally expand on that if that's something that he knows or she knows the, the players really like. So then you can even uh, build a rivalry, which I think we mentioned in Far Touch, for example, mm -hmm. um, this rivalry that can take place between multiple adventuring groups or mentorships or something. So it it gives you kind of the, the outline of here's what's going to happen. Here's some things. Um, that um, are, are critical to what's going on. But beyond that, you here's the things you can expand upon. Mm -hmm. And it's great because that's important because every table is different. Mm -hmm. And no, and that's one thing I've noticed now. Once again, I don't got anything against Wizards of the Coast Publishing. I love their content. I buy all their products. But some of the stuff has gotten down into the point where um, a good example would be Avernus, um, Descent into <laughs> Avernus. Oh, when you do that, there's there is... Here's the few kind of role play parts that are going to happen. Then you're going to get into this dungeon, and then here's these 20 maps for every single room in the dungeon, and here's what's in those. Mm -hmm. um, I, in my case, my group, I have one person that's heavy into combat. Mm -hmm. So I make sure I feed that, but I'm not going to have them going into every single room. Give me an investigation check. All right, you check three rooms. You go on, you find this. There's a bad guy. Fight him instead of having to lead to fight after fight after fight because that's what fits my table. Mm -hmm. and I feel like that's something that kind of falls short in the official content, though I don't have Witchlight yet, and I heard that they really uh, really took a different direction with that, so that may be changing. We'll see. Although, I, to, to, further, to, further expound on, to further expound on that, um, and, well, um, I, I ha and I will fully admit that I have a complicated relationship with what, with Watsi, as you're, as you're well aware, especially <laughs> given, um, especially 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 given how how much t how much time they seem to be spending trying to fix trying to fix past mistakes, like they like they right. work like they work for Hello Games or something. Um, <laughs> some some particular avenues more than others. Looking at you, right. Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'd but I'd like to. I'd like to I'd like to go into the method that the method that I use and and see and see where it intersects with what extraordinary expeditions um, does. Okay. So first off, whenever I do whenever I do uh, when I do campaigns like multi session campaigns, I tend to structure them internally as if I'm as if I'm as if I'm doing a season of a t of a TV show. Okay. Um, Second, second, secondly, and th much in the same way that it's, that a properly run TV show is going to have a series bible, um, I will s bef I will set up a primer when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the adventure that's get that is get that is going to happen, and it's usually it's usually going to be a bit a bit on the a bit on the area, a bit on a bit on the to a bit on the tone leanings. And so, some of the things that might be good idea that might be good ideas to focus on, some of the things that might be bad ideas to focus on. So if it if if for example, I was running a I was running a um a cam a campaign in Ravenloft, I would say, okay, we're do we're d this is de this is definitely going to be it, this is definitely going to be on the lower end of the fantastical. Um, casting classes will will not. Well, not I'm not going to ban it, but I but I am going to exercise caution if anybody picks that. Um, mm -hmm. Try and try and aim for human. If you end up aiming for non-human, people are going to be asking questions. Right. And th and then I then I set up you know session zero and the like. And after and each of the um, sessions get stru get structured like a single episode of a TV show. What w what would they? At an act structure that's not it doesn't it's not a case of a full on script but more of a guideline of of events that may or may not happen um in that right. in that act and then go and then going right on to the next act and so on um how 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 much would how much would a good chunk of that intersect with the adventure design for expeditions 
Um, that really depends on the DM because. Mm-hmm. You're going to have the DM or AK, the director, right, mm-hmm. who determines these are going to happen, period. Um, and others may say, you know what? I give my players sandbox freedoms. They can go wherever they want. Um, this may or may not happen. And for a good example, we'll keep using Far Touch since anybody can go look at that one and kind of follow through. Um, in, in Far Touch, we'll go back to Act, uh, we'll go to, uh, act 3, right? So in Act 3... Um, they've made it to the, basically have made it to the town. Um, and there is a massive open breach where, um, that is, uh, got these different, that's splitting the city and it's got this chaotic portal of, you know, crackling necrotic energy leaping. That's basically transforming, um, what you find out is transforming the people mm-hmm. in the area. Um, the DM may decide, okay, um, all things have led to this in this story. They can totally change that whole part of it, and the the players would never know. The mm-hmm. players wouldn't. It the story is in a way that you could change. You could get rid of the breach. You could get rid of the obelisk and come up with some other reason of why this is happening, and it would still flow really, really well. Um, mm-hmm. And that's and that kind of reminds me of what you're talking about. Where okay. Here's the different acts. I don't care what you do, but here's kind of where you're going. Um, and I don't care how you get there. And I feel like this format fits that. Um, does that is, does that answer your question? Yeah. Or, okay. I'd, I'd say so. And the other thing that I couldn't help but notice as I was go as I was going through it is while there while there's while there's a fair few NPCs as 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 is. Most of the most of the stat blocks that you have are strictly relegated to um, specific monsters. Yes. So um, that was a decision that actually my editor said, "Hey, you should give more stat blocks to the NPCs." Um, and that's to me is one of those things that isn't necessary unless it's going to become a need. Um, for instance, we do give a stat block to um, uh, Lorelei, mm-hmm. but she just uses the city captain watch of the uh, Tomb of Beast stat block. I don't need to put the stat block in there if you've you've you you've got the the the, the book. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't, you can change it to a guard. It can literally be any stat. It could be a veteran. Probably would be the next closest thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the monsters. That's the stuff where the mechanics is going to become more important. So we opted to, in order to keep it, we're talking about keeping things modular and concise, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we opted to not necessarily include stat blocks for some of the things that aren't needed. For instance, the Night Stalkers, we give you a... Um, uh, an entire adventuring party, but we don't need to create uh, stat blocks for those. We can use ones that already exist, such as the priest or the spy or the the, um, the druid. You know, those stat blocks already exist in the monster manual and in the SRD and the free content. So everyone has it. So why waste precious page space duplicating that stuff? Mm-hmm. To me, that's once again something that's not necessary because if the DM decides, hey, I... I want this to be stronger. I want this to be somebody else. They're going to probably change it anyway. At least that's once again in my experience. Mm-hmm. But we also give enough that if they don't, they have access to that stuff um, pretty simply. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's once again kind of yes. Does is it better to have stat blocks for every single thing? Generally, yeah. But in the same token, when you're trying to keep everything into a, a uh, a budget, uh, whether that's a word count budget or um, uh, 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 just a money budget, you have to decide what's more important. So from a developer standpoint, well, yes, I can make stat blocks for this entire Night Stalkers group, but it may or may not ever get used. So why go through the effort when you know that they're likely going to encounter the far-touched aberrations and have to deal with that instead? So that becomes a bigger priority. Mm -hmm. And since we were trying to keep everything under 6,000 words per adventure um, while maximizing the space, that was one of the things, that a decision that we kind of had to to make is do we want to include stat blocks? Because stat blocks can take up a lot of page space and real Mm -hmm. estate, so... Yeah. Um, so we chose to kind of mix it there, and that's kind of the decision that we went with that. Mm-hmm. Oh, now of course. Now the other, the other, um, 
the other a the other avenue when it comes to when it comes to do when it comes to handling encounters is is make is making sure making sure that the that um you do, that you don't end up throwing people into the complete into the full on wolves, you know the whole the whole thing with um challenge rating, which I I know some people some people like and some people really don't care for. Yep, that's something that we did in this adventure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a adventure for a lower level uh, party, level five, if I'm not mistaken. Level, mm -hmm. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a bunch of them, so it's hard to remember. Let me. I think I, you, I think it. you would. I think you had listed out that you have that this is that this um this book is going to have ten adventures. One for one for each starting one for each starting level, but yes, there but there seemed to be the implication that they could be modified to account to accommodate other levels. Oh yeah, um, and that was the that was the other thing. So, uh, well, let me let me finish my other thought before I go into that. So, uh, so for this one, it is uh, for a fifth level party, mm -hmm. but we specifically decided we wanted in going into the extraordinary expeditions, we wanted the characters to visit and be a part of extraordinary things. You know, mm -hmm. every adventure has the go fight the wolves, go fight the kobolds, go fight the goblins. What a fifth level adventure generally never has is, hey, there's an Obelith that's transforming everything and is way too strong for us. What are we going to do? Mm. <laughs> and so that was for this, uh, for Far Touched, exa is, uh, for example, is the direction we went with there, where w if they choose to enter the breach, they find this obelith there and figure out, you know, everything that happened is kind of an accident. He's just trying to get to another location. And so they can reason with him, they can try to negotiate, intimidate, deceive mm -hmm. um, to get him to. Um, to to close up his rift, um, and so they can take the the the, the thing that caused it, the item that, uh, um, the artifact that broke and created this rift, um, to water because he's just trying to get into this world. But in order to get there, they have to pass into the uh into the um far far realm, mm -hmm. and so immediately, even at level five, our players are delving into a world that likely most players don't ever experience. Now, is there dangerous stuff there? Absolutely. And we touch on, hey, this is a great opportunity to expand on this delve or on this expedition if you want them to explore more of this stuff. But you need to make it clear that the stuff that's here will likely kill them pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's more you can do with that. And obviously, with it being an obelisk that's got a CR-10, a level 5 party's probably not going to beat it. Though I'm told it's not completely impossible depending on the types of magic items and stuff that they've been given. Mm -hmm. But um, the goal is there is to throw them in the deep end where they have to resort to a non-combat um, situation, which is something that we tried to touch on in a lot of different adventures. One of the other adventures, for instance, um, the players are level one, I think. I think it's for the level one adventure where a giant purple worm and a huge frost titan are fighting and there's this village that's being destroyed underneath their feet and the goal of the adventurers isn't to fight off the 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 monsters these giant titans that are fighting but instead to help and get the villagers out of danger so we tried to take different approaches when it came to designing the types of encounters that you would run into yes there's going to be role play yes there's going to be combat but not every big boss is something as simple as a bag of hit points. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the, the core design philosophies we went through, though there are a few in there that are like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the goal was try to, to pull away from that a little bit. That's why we wanted to make them extraordinary. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the reasoning behind um, the monster development. But, but once again, because we want it to be modular, you can completely change all the monsters and still run the adventure the exact same way. Mm -hmm. We had a discussion when I wrote Far Touch. She says, well, you could change it to everything's turning into fire elementals and they enter the fire plane mm -hmm. and use the exact same adventure. The only thing you changed is instead of it being Far Touched, you're, they're turning into element, elemental, fire elementals mm -hmm. or they're turning to ash or, or, or something. And you still have to go through this portal and now deal with my man Elemental Lord or Adesion or Ifrit or whatever, Ifriti. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, when we talk modular, that's what we're talking about. 
And that's why um, we do have a good balance of monsters for the levels we recommended. Um, but the DM has the ability to significantly increase or change those monsters at their own discretion. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I got a kind of a rant there. No, no worries. <laughs> no worries. That's up. Um, this is you should know, but you should know by now that this is the kind of show that encur that encourages that kind of thing. Um, but but with that in mind, I'd like to I'd like to go over for briefly the te the ten adventures that are going to be in there, and ju just to get the general feel and to and tone of each of them. Alrighty. So so I'll start. Going. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start from the level one entry to the level t to the level ten entry, which means mm -hmm. I start with collateral damage. Yes, we uh, we did. I just that's actually the one I just referenced, mm -hmm. where the adventuring party is. Um, their goal isn't to fight off the massive threat. They're in a town that's being overrun. And uh, by, they're not, and the enemies aren't attacking the town. They're just fighting each other. Mm -hmm. The town just happens to be in the way, and so are all the people. So the goal is a more of a rescue type mission, mm -hmm. and uh, than it is versus a, a more you know attacking and defending type uh, uh, mission, which also gives the uh, and at least this is what the the, the writer of that was uh, uh, R. Jade from mm -hmm. uh, R. Jade Productions, which she did a great job. Great, great guy when it comes to writing some of the older school style adventures and stuff. But mm -hmm. um, when he wrote it, he says, you know, I like the idea that once the town's done, they can stay there for a while and help rebuild and become invested in that community. And that was something that I wouldn't have thought that you could do in a one shot adventure so easily. But I think he really managed to, to, to pull it off with that one in particular. Mm -hmm. So, so next would be alluring mesas. <laughs> yeah, I really like this one. So I actually just ran this on one of our streams with our extra credit game, mm -hmm. which is our for our, our patrons. Um, it deals with an area that is called the Dragon Spine and is full of uh, giant towering, you know, columns, uh, mesas. And at the top are, you know, a collection of little, you know, tiny cities and I would say villages, right? And they're all connected by inner interchange or interconnecting rope bridges mm -hmm. and so there's a whole description on how they're maintained and all that stuff to keep it going but mm -hmm. um what makes that interesting is it's an investigation mission right people are disappearing or merchants and travelers are disappearing uh and there's also townsfolk who have been committing suicide question mark um there's no evidence that they've um been forcefully pushed off the edge of these mesas but they're being found at the bottoms and that focuses entirely on harpies who are singing their songs that are forcing people um off the cliffs but that only happens you find out because the harpies can only carry so many people and if more people hear that they fall off the edge and just walk right off the mesa mm -hmm. and so that's very much a fun and interesting investigative kind of uh, one because you have to sit and talk to a lot of people. But you see a lot of uh, combat in stories where the harpies are, you know, drowning people or something like that. And so we took a different approach by changing it to an extraordinary area that they wouldn't, you wouldn't generally, you know, they're not generally, you know, found in. And so for this one, the idea of, you know, finding feathers in, in blood splatters and, you know, uh, misidentif potentially misidentifying the, the feather as, um, uh, something else than what it actually is. You know, there's a lot of clues that can get mixed up and stuff. So that one was a, a really uh, fun one that I en I enjoyed running and writing and running a lot. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. How does that sound to somebody? Uh, how does that sound to you? I I like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the next one on the list is don't kill the messenger. Um. So this is a really fun one. There's two uh, cities kind of subtly at war mm -hmm. and the um a strange event is happening in gloomhold and there is a massive surge of mercenaries traveling across you know the the region to get to the city um but you're not there anybody that tries to get in are you know beat up and, and left to rot you know you need permission or whatever so the 
the characters are hired to infiltrate this to figure out what's going on. So mm -hmm. not only do they have to infiltrate this marching band or band of mercenaries, mm -hmm. but then they have to get into the city. And then once they're in the, the, the gloom hold, they have to figure out who's in charge, what they're planning, what is all of this about. So um, while there is fighting and there is poisoning and some stuff like that, they basically have to then report back to the... Uh, the person that hired them mm -hmm. and depending on how the investigation goes the the um, the the person that hired them the employer will have them hey you need to poison this person um, or, or make it look like an accident but you need to basically assassinate them so mm -hmm. it goes from um, uh, an in informant style game to depending on how their informant goes i guess and what information they report back because remember it's based on skill checks mm -hmm. so if they get poor skill checks the end result's going to be different than if they had got really good skill checks um mm -hmm. because of misunderstandings and misinformation and that could lead to a full-out war between these two these two cities or it, it turns out that it's nothing and they report on and move on with their business and you've now fleshed out a a faction war between these two people that are, are two cities that are kind of keeping it under wraps, I guess. Mm. Uh, <laughs> once again, we're taking a different a route than just the tank and spank, excuse my video game terminology, style adventures. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, so the the next one on the next one on the list would be Magma Forge Outpost. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun one. Um, so this one is, uh, this is probably closer to something most people are familiar with where, um, the, the player characters basically have accepted, you know, uh, a offer to clear a magma forge that's been discovered in mm -hmm. exchange for loot. So this is very much starting off as a typical explore the dungeon, right? And actually we had a cover art, a really nice art piece made for this. That was a lot of fun. Um, and it features a lot of elementals and fires. I think, uh, he features the fire guys from. Tomo Beast, which is a lot of fun, as well as a Red Dragon Wormly. Um, so the players, you know, they gain entry to the Magma Forge, a lot of, you know, um, uh, dungeon crawling, and you find the there's an infestation of elementals, and as a DM, we do give you the Mephits are number one, Fire Guys, and some other stuff, but there are, uh, you can expand upon that with whatever type of fire elementals you want, or, mm -hmm. or you know, fire, fire themed monsters. Um, so, uh, once they kind of, uh, uh, get to the bottom uh, of the forge, they find this massive portal to the elemental plane of fire is open. So mm -hmm. part of the goal is to, to close this portal while they're under attack by enemies. And then you also have, uh, once they clear that up, um, they actually, uh, are able to enter the forge and discover, you know, um, that there is a complex dwarven mechanism that has basically has a door locked on it. And if they can manage to pass this, they basically discover a, a, a young bla uh, red dragon egg mm -hmm. um, and two dragons defending it, uh, wormling dragons. So not only is this planner portal thing opened, but there are these new dragon, red, young dragons who have basically set up their nest here. And so it leads to a negotiation because the dragons aren't hurting anybody and since they're intelligent creatures it leads to a negotiation of hey you can't make your home here well we were here first you came here later so it's ours and there's this kind mm -hmm. of back and forth which once again you could just slay the dragons and move on or you can negotiate with them and maybe uh uh in one of the play tests it be the the players became kind of uh made a deal say hey if you become guardians of the forge and defend you know these people they'll let you stay here um, and so they negotiated this treaty between these dragons who set the Magna Forge as their home as well, uh, with the, 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 um, the High Lord of uh, uh, Vundermold, I think his name was. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot going on there, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So next, w w now, next would be Far Touched, but I think we've covered Far Touched pretty yep. extensively so far. Um, yep, so I would I'm, agree. So I'm skipping over that, and I'm going straight to Grumblekin's Arena. Guess what that's about? <laughs> Aggressive negotiation? <laughs> yeah, so 
Um, Gromokin uh, is a hobgoblin crime lord that runs o- only the most entertaining Coliseum fights in all of the realms. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> their arena is known far and wide to attract tourists um, from all other lands, which means there's quite the the melting pot of races and even intelligent monsters. Unfortunately, though, in this adventure, it is also a front for a big deal of crime, ranging from drug trafficking, purchasing and slave fighters, and rig matches for the purposes of gambling and profiteering. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of start uh, to to see where this is going. Um, recently, in the uh, in the uh, ga- in the sh- adventures timeline. Um, a lord who governed the entertainment district passed away due to old age, and his son, uh, Versinicus, <laughs> that sounds very much like it belongs in Roman times, if you ask me, mm-hmm. uh, uh, has kind of taken over his holdings, and he really doesn't turn a blind eye to these these criminal activities that his fa- like his father once did. So after publicly threatening to crack down on the illegal gambling and the slave trade um, in the district as a, a way to force compliance from Grumblekin, Lord Merton has been kidnapped. And so now we have a rescue mission. Um, mm-hmm. And his family received an anonymous note written on a you know stained uh, 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 gladiator timetable that drew, drew a rough map of a... Uh, uh, an area underneath the uh, the arena, and so the players have to go uh, find this kidnapped uh, lord, rescue him, save him, and 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 bring him back. And as you can imagine, a lot of different uh, things uh, go into it. But the big thing is is engaging in the arenas and meeting with the 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 gladiators and their sponsors Mm -hmm. and getting information to figure out where all this stuff is and where they can you know find the entrance to this underground place and stuff so it's very fun Mm -hmm. uh very cool once again we're taking we're not we wanted to do more than just the go here kill this bring it back Mm -hmm. we wanted to give options yeah um when it comes to grombokin's arena would the for those who wanted it would there be the option of Say so, of say subbing in for one of the gladiators to try. absolutely, um, and some of them uh, it encourages you to like knock them out or mm-hmm. uh, bribe them to take a fall and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. a lot of lot of a lot to be had there in the stadium arena. That's more than just nonstop fighting, mm-hmm. uh, which is a thing you can do as well. You could win and then get your reward and ask any question and get an answer and stuff like that. But um, it's designed to be very. Uh, um, role play a mix of uh, half role play half combat mm-hmm. um, but you can you can really change it entirely to be all combat if you really really wanted to um, which once again falls under that whole uh, modular so if you decide to take this route here's you know some of the details here's where the end result is mm-hmm. um, and the DM can change and fit that to their as they need yeah now the next one is den of the skull dragon this is a fun one uh, so in the Den of the Skull Dra- Dragon, which is level 7, the city of Greyborn holds nearly 6,000 citizens and easily 1,000 or more passing merchants and travelers through you know, wet marshlands. Mm-hmm. The area is a nexus of travel as it is the only city in the marshlands. So anyone who seeks a night of respite uh, on their trek you know, ends up here generally. While the area isn't the most welcoming, it does offer the resources and uh, resources and uh uh, specifically the perfect soil and moisture to grow rice. Um, and so that's pretty cool. But a, mm-hmm. about a month prior, a strange fog had kind of rolled into the land and um, hasn't really gone away. It just kind of appeared and it has been stuck there. Mm-hmm. Um, and around that same time, the, the citizens began to discover that the water in the air has been fouled. So the local government uh, official named Henry de Bolbeck a noble and government leader has placed notices on every job board uh, in the city that he seeks anyone willing to investigate the source of the contaminating the city's water supply. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a lot that goes into that and a lot of kind of chit chat between the locals and learning when it kind of started. Um, And what they end up uncovering is that, and now they, they do promise a fun reward. This is one of the first ones where an outright magical item is one of the rewards. Mm -hmm. And it's a cloak of the Arachnida, uh, Arachnida, uh, Mm -hmm. which basically imbues the wearer with the ability to do pretty much whatever a spider can. So, you know, (laughs) take that how you want, but uh, which is an easily substitutable item, but it's Mm -hmm. one of their, like their city's treasures. Mm -hmm. That's how bad their, the situation is so bad 
that they're willing to give up one of their city's treasures, and you can go with whatever flavor you want mm -hmm. for that item. A sword just seemed a little on the nose, so we just like, let's pick something we wouldn't expect. Yeah, uh, a piece of cloth seemed to work. <laughs> everybody, everybody always go. I've joked. I've joked about. How, I've joked. I remember writing an article a long time ago on the blog that I nuked called um, called de called um, death by plus one longsword. <laughs> Which yes, was, I love it. Was it me taking the piss? Yes. the <laughs> the whole the whole fo the whole focus was was to tell D was to tell DMs to ver to um vary things up so that so that treasure actually feels like treasure. Um, mm -hmm. And speaking from my own experience, most of most of the time, um, I I've had and sometimes this has annoyed people. I have had it where. It where um when you get when you get treasure from say a dungeon, you don't know what it you don't know what it is until you get it appraised. Right, right. It could be that's something I wish they wouldn't have gotten rid of in fifth edition. Oh, um, it's and I and sometimes sometimes I would have little charts so I could put so I could put random enchantments. Um, it was very rarely just a plus X. It was always right. it was always there was always some some di some different kind of thing. Um, some t um, in one particular instance, I used that so I, so somebody could have a somebody could have a crossbow that I basically used so I could so I could put the noisy cricket in the campaign because I because I like giving things <laughs> I like giving people powerful but ri po ridiculously powerful but equally dangerous weaponry. I and love it. <clears throat> on one hand, it's a crossbow that you don't need to load. And it and it is and it is it does a lot of sonic damage. On the other <laughs> hand, nice. um, it it does it. On the other hand, much like the noisy cricket, you're gonna get knocked on your ass. <laughs> that's a great trade off. I love. That's fantastic. I always, I always, um, I will admit one of the inspirations was um, one of the things and one of the things that helped bring help bring it back was. I was playing Cursed Halo and see and um seeing how the shotgun was replaced with a blunderbuss, mm -hmm. which has which has so much kickback that you can um you can use it for a you can use it to well blunder jump, <laughs> you know like you know like rock you know like rocket jumping and rocket quake. jumping yeah um but that brings me to to the next to the next one on the list Dark oh, Fathom oh, one second oh good there's one thing i feel like i got to tell you what the source of the source of the the poison is so a uh young black dragon named nilhog made itself a new lair in an area of the marshland known the metal fetid pool mm -hmm. and its noxious chemicals are just running into the water and it doesn't even know and or care um which once again is one of those sorts of encounters where it can be so much more than just um, slaying a beast. But what makes it really interesting is we focused on using the regional effects that some of the dragons have mm -hmm. um, as clues that nature checks and skill checks can reveal, mm -hmm. um, which is really fun. So, all right, all right. So, what's the next one? Next one is Dark Fathom Crypt, and if my soundboard worked, I would play the laugh of the crypt keeper for this one. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Um, so uh, the Dark Fathom Crypt was once a prominent wood elf sentiment, mm -hmm. uh, settlement that was built deep in the depths of a forest hidden under the depths of the canopies of an eternal titan oak of trees. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a beautiful town with a promising future, but it, led, it was led by the Green Council and the city served as the voice of nature in the region. Mm -hmm. Dark Fathom ambassadors would negotiate on behalf of the creatures of the forest and preserve the, the sanctity of the wild and within the borders of the Wood Elf kingdom. Mm -hmm. That was until the dark day came in which the city was forced to be evacuated. A, a, a dark druid, which is something you don't see very often... Right. Usually you see dark, you know, wizards and necromancer, but a dark druid, you know, somebody who who bent, uh, focuses more on the death aspect of nature than mm -hmm. the life. Right. Which is kind of opposing opposing sides. Um, mm -hmm. He had basically risen to power and um, decided that there needed to be a more aggressive approach to defending um, defending the, 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 the world from 
you know, infidels, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he's a little more aggressive. That means, you know, killing and, and whatever is necessary. So several decades later after this happened, you know, the plants in the area became much more violent and dangerous and they're sending in more, uh, you know, adventurers to quell the, the, the violence. And it slowly became a corrupted forest um, twisted by this, this, this dark, uh, this dark druid. Mm -hmm. Now this was something that happened, you know, some time ago. So now centuries later, uh, our, our adventure kind of starts off where, uh, the forest, uh, uh, now, uh, centuries later since this happened, the, the depths of the forest have been all but abandoned and citizens, citizens of the Dark Fathom have resettled. The forests around the city have slowly started to kind of return to normal. However, in these dangerous times, the voice of nature goes unheard. So a new Groom Council is emerging and wishes to reclaim the city. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, guess what they must do? Go, go, in, and de go in and deal with the angry hippie. <laughs> yes, and basically now they have to, um, they have to purge the corruption. Mm -hmm. So now they have to literally do the exact opposite of what the Green Council's original goal was, which was to dis descend, to, uh, defend nature. Mm -hmm. So y you get kind of this. This is one that's driven heavily on lore. Mm -hmm. So when you have the character that, if you have the player that's big on lore and history, this is going to be the adventure for them because you're going to be able to tie a lot of what's going on back to how it was and see that the point of view changes over time. Um, and sometimes you have to take drastic, uh, you have to go against what you normally believe, you know, mm -hmm. the green council, for instance, you know, they're all about protecting nature, but here you, they are hiring people to kill nature, mm -hmm. uh, so that they can protect nature. So it's very, uh, interesting. And there's a lot of fun, uh, monsters that go into this with like the decrepit blight vines and, mm -hmm. uh, the spectral vine children and stuff. So there's a lot of ambushing that happens, which is fun. Um, and it really is, uh, the, the corrupted trends are just awesome, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they just, they'll, they'll melt, uh, melt the, melt the heroes pretty quickly, which is pretty fun. Yeah. Um, but once again, um, it's, it's, it follows that, okay, wh what can we do differently than what normally happens? And while this is certainly something that we've, is probably not a hundred percent unique, um, as we would like it to be, the story and stuff that comes with it that fills out the world really taps into that, you know, uh, world building aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, next one on the next one on the list is Zenith Athenium, and I'm pretty sure I mispronounced the latter part of that. Yeah, I have no idea how to pronounce that. I was looking for synonyms for library, and that came up. <laughs> so um, uh, I have no idea if that's how you pronounce that. Ath I keep, Athenium. I keep, Athenium. I keep thinking of that because I look at it and I keep thinking Athena. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I can totally, uh, I can totally see that. Uh, Athenium is supposed to be a, a, I guess, I like a synonym for. Uh, like a sanctuary or library or something along those lines. So, uh, so this one was actually a really, really fun one because something that I feel doesn't get done well enough is deserts. Um, deserts are something that is often wait hand waved when people just are traveling. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a missed opportunity for a number of reasons. Um, number one being sandstorms don't have to be something you have to deal with as far as combat, but losing important objects in the middle of a sandstorm is certainly something they should have to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this one took an interesting turn. So the desolate wastelands is nearly endless desert expanse. So mm -hmm. before the impact of a star from the heavens shattered and decimated the lands, it was a vast, vibrant, uh, civilized jungle. The impact left massive cracks that allowed uh, heat from the core to seep to the surface, leaving the ground too hot to sustain life. So the mm -hmm. virulent life basically was replaced by a sea of endless sand, um, and thus you have the 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 the, des the place known as the desolate wastelands. Mm -hmm. uh, the largest populated city in the wastelands currently is known as Karnak, Karnak, mm -hmm. and it's the closest city to the West Ocean, only eight days of travel um, by dust sled. So there's a bit of rural building. How do the people in this area, you know, uh, get around? They use they use you know sleds that are 
pushed by wind, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they have these constant little way things, which was really fun. So, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the character's kingdom is now this is, uh, once again, where it goes beyond the scope of the adventure, but allows for it to easily tie into, a uh, a, 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 a campaign setting. The character's kingdom is in a near endless war and the characters have been tasked by their benefactor to obtain information as to a way to defeat uh, their tyrannical, and we use the queen of witches, but you can insert your, you know, own villain, you know, leaders here. Mm -hmm. um, and the characters uh, may just be passing through Karnak or are on their way to that location or have come up uh, here to venture into the desolate wastelands to find treasure or seek uh, a, a way to help end the something that'll help end the world war. So uh, for the last fa uh, few years, uh, Pixrin Galixern, a dragonborn scholar, has been venturing out of the desert to locate a legendary library, and they stumble across this with uh, uh, while they're or they basically run into this person by mistake. Papers are scattered everywhere, and they have. Uh, a little discussion about what she's trying to do and where she's trying to go. Mm -hmm. And the entire adventure is one that takes place tr just getting to this location because the thought is that if we came here to look for a way to end of the war, mm -hmm. this place may either have powerful artifacts that might help us or mm -hmm. some sort of knowledge that can be leveraged to defeat the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, as the characters are traveling through the, the the desolate waste all kinds of crazy random shit can happen uh we have a big d20 table in here with mm -hmm. all these different things that can happen for encounters um it does give thorough details on how to run the travel um where things such as uh create food and water and and, and you know locate plants and animals becomes a real critical uh aspect of this travel because mm -hmm. if you don't have those it's going to be much more dangerous right mm -hmm. um and the party may or may not think about that that's up for that's for them to decide yeah. but dm should be aware but then we have this big kind of random encounters uh in the desert encounter now i knew early on that i don't want every encounter to be some big bad combat encounter so i was trying to think of what are some ways we could tie in not only where they're what they're doing but kind of make a day eventful so for example one of the encounters is high above the hot horizon a lint glints off a silver dragon's glossy scales shining silvery white mm -hmm. the character who succeeds on a dc 19 arcana check identifies the creature as an adult mithril dragon Mm -hmm. With no character, if no character identifies it, uh, Pixrian bursts with excitement and says, uh, with looking through her scrolls, Lore yeah. says that the Zenith Athenium lies within the domain of a mithril dragon. We must be getting close. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of a small, simple encounter that reveals not only a bit of information about the, uh, the Athenium that they may not have known, but also creates, uh, hey, this thing is going on in the distance. Um, and creates kind of a, a cool effect, then you just kind of move on. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's other encounters that lead into entire dungeon delves um, that you can, you can take. Now, obviously, that's beyond the scope of this, but mm -hmm. it gives you detail of some of the things that um, the, the players might find. Another one is them stumbling across the uh, a massive you know, tunnel that's left by a, a sandworm or a purple worm, if you want to use that instead, mm -hmm. that they just kind of stumble across. And it's up to you if they decide to follow it because it's shade and cool, and cool and they'll be able to get, you know, some, uh, some coverage. Maybe they'll run into it. Maybe they won't. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of my favorites uh, that we did that I thought really was uh, pretty cool, it's where the, the characters um, stumble across uh, Gypsophinks which is from the uh, a Sphinx from the, the Tomo Beast, which basically uh, is sitting at an obelisk waiting for people to pass by and, uh, and has rewards should they answer their riddles, which why is uh, Gino, uh, Gypso Sphinx just waiting? That's something that the DM can expand upon. Did they get lost when they found it? Did they see it in the distance and approach it? Because you can say, you know, you spot a large, you know, black-winged creature in the distance with an alabaster body, uh, and vulture beaked head off in the distance. They don't have to go there. They may choose to. They may choose not to. You know, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we really wanted to f focus on. Don't even get me started on the Oasis uh, from 
uh, uh, Tome of Beasts, where it's an entire illusionary oasis that's just a giant ooze trying to eat shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the Dune Mimic, that's another one. So a lot of good stuff um, that really makes the, the desert crawl so much more fun. And of course, then once they get to the Zenith, uh, uh, Athenium. They meet a silver dragon. They can reason with it. Her name's Sylphrenia, and she's very, um, very interesting character in and of her own right. And uh, a lot of stuff that can go around. Uh, the, a lot of different ways you can utilize the library. She just says that uh, she has some conditions um, that the players have to follow, and if they break mm-hmm. them. Then she gets all pissed off, and then they're boned. And because it's a mithril dragon, they're probably not going to be able to handle a direct fight. But she also does other things like spy on them and stuff, which is fun. So, mm-hmm. all right, sorry, that was long winded. <laughs> I really that was that was that was one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, and last but certainly not least would be the hunter. Yeah. This is a this is a, a very interesting one. Uh, this expedition consists of a single puzzle encounter, which is very un, uh, uh, unlike what some of the stuff we did. Um, th- designed for four to six 10th level players. Mm-hmm. It is ideally run in a single session due to the nature of potential you know, character deaths. There's some details on that uh, later in the thing. But prior to the beginning of the session, uh, it is advised to the game master that um, that they obtain copy of the player's character sheet for their own reference because you're going to want this because it really relies on a, a, a unique uh, surprise. So, you know, the, the player characters encounter a strange old vagrant whom they are drawn to for whatever reason the, the DM decides there are some, once again, some recommendation. He requests their assistance and they feel compelled to help for some reason or other, mm-hmm. usually greed. Uh, he does ask. <laughs> he does ask uh, for a, ha- uh, a hand up as uh, they assist him. Uh, they are transported to another location. So as he's trying to literally get up, um, if they reach out and help him, they end up somewhere else, which is one of those few moments in our adventures where we use this kind of um, setting change in such a way, but. Uh, it's important because now that they're in the lair of the hunter, a small and strange forest location, the players are tasked with solving a puzzle before being killed. Mm -hmm. Um, and the hunter perches himself high in the catwalks amongst the trees and basically constantly is stalking and attacking and trying to kill the player characters while they're trying to solve this puzzle. So this is a really throwback to me to some of the, or the very first Tomb of Horrors that Gary Gygax did was mm-hmm. designed to test the combat capacity and the skills that the players had in a way that could lead to potential death. And this is the only one that we really took that sort of aggressive stance on, and there's lots of kind of warnings in it. But mm-hmm. this is one where all the abilities, they can't deal with them outright. So they have to find ways to escape. So all the abilities with increasing speed, going invisible, creating distractions, uh, blending in, all those are going to shine here to buy time because that's their goal. Buy time so they solve this puzzle. And uh, it, it really is great. And it is worth noting that either they all die or they solve the puzzle. <laughs> There's kind of... Uh, it's kind of a, a, a rough a rough one. So if you're looking for something to really challenge your players in a scene where they they feel helpless, this is the one. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, with all, with each of, with each of these, um, there's I've seen a, I've seen a bit of a bad habit amongst among certain. Um, certain module and certain and certain in, and certain encounter designers to intru- to introduce new r- introduce new sandbox elements, whether it be races, whether it be classes or or whatnot. And not not that there's anything wrong with that, but I've I'm of the old fashioned opinion of I'd l- of keep of keep the keep the player facing expansion in a player facing book. Oh. I would agree. None, none of this, none of this whole gra- grab a bunch of stuff from all over the place and toss and toss it in one, toss it in one book. Call me old fashioned. Um, you mean like uh, player options and magic spells and magic items and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan of. Um, I like to an example of an example of how to do this kind of thing right. In my, in my opinion, were the power series of expansion books for um, fourth edition. 
Okay. How each each of them each of them was each of them was very much player facing, but they're all um, centered around a theme. If you if you picked up say um, arcane, arcane power, yep, you'd know exactly what it was going to be focused on, and the all the powers, feats, um, parag paragon paths, ma magic items, and sometimes mundane items would be in service to that. Right. Right. Um. And I've I've seen it sometimes where adventure modules, regardless of edition, I don't want to seem like I'm picking on Five E alone with this when it's when it's this isn't a new phenomenon. Will decide to include player facing in things for new for new races, new classes or subclasses, feats, magic items, especially feats in the third edition days, um, right? And presti or prestige classes, but. Would it be fair of me to say that with extraordinary expeditions, aside from aside from some appropriate charts, you are not doing that? Right. It is just the the adventures. Mm -hmm. There are some magic items, but that's because the adventures called for them. Um, but beyond that, there's no player options, none of that stuff. We wanted to keep this small and within a certain target range. Mm -hmm. um, I say small, but it's still <laughs> going to be... Uh, pretty decent. Uh, each, like I said, each adventure is four to six thousand words. So, well, so um, without so, size is size is relative. What might be what might be warm what might be warm for this time of year for my standards it is unbearably cold <laughs> for other people. Right, right. <laughs> oh. It is also worth noting that we tried to go for an old school uh, art style. So you'll notice that uh, one of our we did a lot of black and white sketch art. Mm -hmm. um, even our even we even made our fancy maps black and white, um, which turned out really really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and of the style we were going for, uh, I wanted something that's a reminder of the old, uh, not the old days, but the the more rough and tumble art style. But I think mm -hmm. it still it turned out really really good. It mix it fits really well with the the color scheme and and everything. So. Um, I'm really happy with how that turned out. The rough and tumble style without the rough and tumble rule set. Yes. Because. <laughs> oh, but. Uh, well, give, I, I don't feel like picking on Thaco for the umpteenth time, even though I'm going to do it again sometime this month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who bust out the calculator? Oh, if I wanted to bust, we're not talking about Rollmaster. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, two hit armor class. I like, I don't know that anybody. Uh, I, I some people did like that though. Oh, it, on once you un, once you understand how it how it works, it's fine. I've always argued that Thaco is a de a decent idea that was poor that was poorly explained. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, some I'd say I'd say a good chunk of that is is. Do, is due to the fact that a lot, a lot of that early D and D crowd were um, co were college kids, and and had a college kid kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, oh, come on, cat! You got to get off me. <laughs> <laughs> but, with, but even even within even within that, would it be fair? Would it be fair for me to say that when it comes to when it comes to say when it comes to say monsters, the only time the only time that they're getting stat blocks is if it's a stat block that's either non-standard or there's something about that particular monster that isn't going to be standard. Yes, yes, that's that's uh, very yeah. The the standard monsters they just have bold text, uh, mm -hmm. which is a Watsi standard. The monsters that appear and then we put stat blocks are not standard. They either from uh, either something we've created or from the Tome of Beasts. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, anywhere else we may have gotten them, but yeah. um, they are in. They are in there because a, it's just easier to have the sta monster stat block right with where the adventure is going to need it, mm -hmm. as well as uh, we wanted the the people to know that this is a big deal. Yeah. Now, part of the reason I brought I brought up the I brought up the idea of standard monsters being used in a non-standard way is because of the um, layer abilities that Fifth Edition introduced. And I'm cur I'm curious if if um some of the monsters that you have for this have something similar. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? My cat's kind of being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, cut her off. Me. Well, it's a cat. Yeah, she's being obnoxious. Oh, uh, but given how given how given how fifth edition introduced um layer a bit layer abilities and the and the like for mm -hmm. for your for your b bag type of type encounters, um. 
I'm curious if if um so if some of the if some of the encounters within um extra in extraordinary Ep expeditions have have some si have some similar abilities. So I am of the mind that most of the monster stat blocks are generally uneventful. So I try to include monsters that not only have some sort of lair, but some sort of reaction or a legendary actions or mm -hmm. something because um, it adds more when more is, more th more action economy is better for a more engaging combat. So, for instance, in Far Touched, you'll see uh, the monsters have a reaction, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, something you don't see as often at lower levels. Um, so we wanted to make sure we use monsters that always feel like combat is flowing, whether that's lair actions, legendary, or reactions. Mm -hmm. And that's something I pride myself on in any of the monsters I developed personally because those are fun when you're attacking players on their turn. <laughs> uh, I'm, remi I'm reminded of how, um, of how the first time that I ran 4th edition, i.e. the edition that ev that everyone, including probably Watsy, tells me I'm supposed to hate, mm. um, but I don't because, <laughs> I don't because I'm not getting paid, um, their first encounter was was with was with half a dozen kobolds, and yep. they had thought, "Oh, it's just kobolds. They're gonna they're gonna be pushovers." Ah! Minions can destroy a party. <laughs> <laughs> they wiped. Yeah. TPK that... TPK on the first encounter as a bunch of first levelers. There is an adventure called Killer Kobolds, written by I think it's PB Publishing. Um. Uh, and oh my gosh, dude, it gives you, when you, <laughs> you want to see how dangerous kobolds are, run that adventure because holy crap, man, they will just demolish a group of players if you play them with any, it's from Tony Petrucca, not PB Publishing, mm -hmm. uh, any sort of, uh, any sort of simple strategies. They're so smart. They have such, kobolds are so terrors. And they just don't get utilized to their full uh, ad, uh, full ability because people just use them as meat bags when, in fact, they prefer to set traps. They prefer to ambush, um, not just charge in all higgledy piggledy swinging <laughs> weapons. And and so uh, that will if you run that adventure or that set of, that 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 uh, group of adventures, uh, your players will see kobolds in a whole new light. <laughs> Yeah, that, uh, a bit of a rant. That's, so, that's something that I think a lot of people forget is that if if you're if if you're dealing with if you're dealing with an enemy who's go, who's going to be who's who just as a baseline is bigger, stronger, and has more numbers than you, you're not going to fight fair, right? And they don't. <laughs> like, if 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 I am if I am facing off if I am facing off against a against a literal giant, the for, my first instinct is going to be go for the nuts. <laughs> yeah. Go for the jewels. I love mm -hmm. it. Because, because um, if it's stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. Right. <laughs> That's like uh, my buddy used to say. Uh, everyone would give him a hard time for sniping in games and camping. He's like, it's a legitimate strategy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, um, don't hate the player, hate the game is is what I say when it comes when it comes to camping because. Um, that's a that camping is a is a is a symptom of of when of when somebody isn't designing their maps to um to allow to allow for other styles. Right, right. Oh. Uh, do you do you have a time uh, frame? Because uh, before we're finished up here, because I'm sorry, but I'm getting tired and I actually have to get up at five a.m. <laughs> no, so. no worries, man. I can I. I got I got you covered. But um, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count to, to kind of wrap to kind of wrap things up? Oh, jeez, dude! I totally have the answer for that somewhere, and I don't have it off my head. Hang on one second. I can see mm -hmm. if I can come up with one. Let me go because we're way over what we thought we were. Um, because when we did when we did our original page count, we did it by text and forgot about the art and the maps. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna end up being bigger than we originally intended, which is unfortunate. Um, but that's just the mistake I made that I'm going to have to eat the, eat the cost on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's 
got so many things here. Hang on. Uh, I think we'll probably be uh, around a uh, hundred or so, mm-hmm. uh, maybe a hundred and twenty. Um, we were targeting like seventy or eighty, so <laughs> it's way over where we were going, but uh, mm-hmm. uh, not great. <laughs> <laughs> So Dang. problems in developing don't make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, ex- except you, except it's inevitable that you that you will make that you will make mistakes because no plan ever survives the first encounter. Yep. But absolutely. With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come back up to the temple. Yeah, thank you for having me. I always enjoy these conversations. They're so much fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to further dis- go into extraordinary expeditions or just to perform glorified shit posting, the door I'm down is for that. Open. <laughs> <laughs> um, As careful, and, I'll take you up on that. Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> as As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I love it. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>